Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I was eight years old and very much a nature buff. When I was 10, I was helping grad students at the University of Michigan identify rare birds. I was walking east along the railroad tracks with my friend, who was nine. We were picking up rocks and talking, and as we were getting closer to the railroad bridge that crosses the Huron River, a fast stream at that point, we noticed an odor that smelled like an like old roadkill mixed with cabbage. In retrospect, rather hard to identify, but very strong and distinct. We were expecting to come across a deer or some other animal that had been killed by a train. While crossing the bridge, about an 80 to 100 foot long, my friend grabbed my arm and jerked it as if to show me something real quick. I looked over and he was pointing down over the south side of the bridge. I took a few steps to look down and about 20 feet below us was the biggest pair of hairy shoulders I have ever seen. The creature looked like an ape, but its shoulders were massive as if it were wearing football pads under its skin. Because of this, its head looked almost small. It had dark brown fur, which covered every part of the creature. Though we never saw its face, it was crouched by the east bank of the river, looking down into the water. It didn't appear to be moving much, and I don't remember splashing or ripples from where the creature was squatting. We didn't stay long. I'd say we looked at it for five to seven seconds before my friend started running east, and I followed him. His home was about a mile down the track, and when we got there, he ran up into his room and locked the door. I had to call my father to pick me up. I lived on the east shore of Briggs Lake. For some reason, this event ended our friendship. Although it frightened me a bit, I spent a lot of time in the school library trying to figure out what kind of creature that looks like a big-shouldered ape that lives in the Midwest. This is when I first learned of the Bigfoot phenomena. I lived in the area for three years and spent a lot of time in these wooded areas, but this is the only experience I had at the time. We were walking along the train tracks, picking up good rocks to throw at the next train that goes by. The area is mixed forest and not too thick among small rolling hills. There is a quarry about a half a mile east of the bridge and Island Lake Recreation Area about one and a half miles west. The nearest home to the bridge was about 0.7 miles west. On to the next one. In Lee Township near Midland in Midland County in Michigan. I was 10 years old. My aunt, my cousin, and myself were out in the woods behind my grandma's house. We had been working on building a cabin all summer just for fun. We would often pack a picnic lunch and spend the day out in the woods. I heard a noise, like snapping twigs. I turned around and saw in the distance a glimpse of a figure running that appeared light brown in color. I first thought that it was one of my other cousins coming back to help, and then dismissed it from my mind and continued on with the work. Later that day, when we were walking back up to Grandma's house, I then discovered that it could not have been my other cousin, because he had a blue shirt on, not a light brown one. The following weekend, my aunt, two of my cousins, and myself were working on the cabin. We ate lunch. Then my cousins and I walked up the trail and down an incline 
to play on a huge grapevine that we like to climb on. I looked up and saw a hairy brown man-like creature sitting up against the fenced post. He was sitting on his behind with his legs bent up, his arms were wrapped around his legs. He was just looking at us. I screamed. My cousin looked over and we ran with my other cousin who is younger than us. She did not see what we saw. I looked back once and the creature was standing in an upright position. I'm not sure if he ran after us or not. I was too scared to look back. To this day, the cabin is not finished. We have all been too scared to go back. One week before, I heard a noise in the woods, like snapping twigs. I looked up and saw a light brown-like figure running through the woods. I figured it was just my other cousin coming back in the woods to help with the building of the cabin. I have heard of other people in the same neighborhood talk about noises in the woods and about high-pitched screams and squeals. It was mid-afternoon. It was warm and sunny, about 70 degrees. On to the next one. In Midland County in Michigan, Mrs. Foster and her daughter Lori were driving along on Patterson Road Lori was driving. They neared Pine River Road when a being leapt out from the right side of the road in an arc about four feet high. It landed in the middle of the road. It then rebounded into the air and, in a second leap, disappeared into the underbrush on the left side of the road. Each leap was at least 30 feet. Lori slammed on the brakes when the figure hit the road, although the women were 200 feet away. It was upright and slender of build with smooth, dull black color from head to foot. Torso, neck, and head were of normal human proportions. It was the size and build of a slender teenage boy. It was similar to a kangaroo in the large leaps it made. If the figure had arms, they were not visible to either woman. Lori drove ahead to where it had landed, but could see no sign of it. Both were too frightened to get out and look for it. On to the next one. In Kalkaska County in Michigan, we were traveling home from Kalkaska about dusk when we came around a bend and our headlights hit an animal's eyes glowing back. The driver, being an avid hunter, backed up to inquire. A smaller than you normally hear of, lighter in color, Bigfoot was there. It, at first, was sitting with its legs crossed on a log. When our headlights hit it, it stood up startled and strode off into the woods. There were five people in the vehicle. Only a few people will talk openly about it. Most would prefer to remain anonymous. It was after dark in a small clearing. On to the next one. In Galdwin County in Michigan, I was snowmobiling in heavy cedar pines, off-trail snowmobiling on state land near Father's Cabin. I'm 50 now, but when I was 15, my father had a modern cabin in Lower Upper Michigan near Galdwin, Michigan. I saw something in the woods near Street Lake. I know the country pretty good, as I hunted, fished, and snowmobiled in the area. We lived in Brooklyn, Michigan, and I would travel to the cabin on my dad's days off. It was winter. My younger brother and I were out doing nighttime off-trail snowmobiling. We were on the state park next to my dad's place. My brother was leading. We were in cedar pines, most of them not more than 10 inches in diameter. I know this because my dad used to have me cut firewood and poles for fences. Snow was pretty deep, and we were moving over snags pretty good at about 10 miles per hour. My brother took a turn ahead of me. He was about 50 feet or so in front of me. As I began my turn to follow, to the left of my headlight caught something next to a 6-inch thick cedar. It stood about 7 or more feet. It had its left hand on the tree, looking over its bicep at me. Its body was turned toward my brother. 
I thought I was seeing things, but its body was showing on the other side of the tree. A bear came to mind, but then, as I was watching it, a gorilla is what I thought. As I made my turn, which was about 10 feet off my right, I picked up speed, craning my neck as I watched it stand there, following me with its head. I caught up to my brother and told him to head back to the cabin, but on the trail. I stayed right behind him until we got back to the cabin about 20 minutes. I never saw the thing follow, so I've always been somewhat reluctant to say something. When we got inside, I told my dad and brother what I had seen. I was pretty terrified when I saw it and stayed that way through the night. The next morning, we took the machines back out and followed our trails in the snow. We found some type of foot that was bigger than my dad. To this day, after spending many years also in the Yellowstone area, after leaving the service and working for the West Yellowstone Police Department and Gallatin County Search and Rescue, I cannot believe what I saw. I have been on snowmobiles and in my truck driving the trails around the park for hunting or recreation and have seen many grizzlies of various colors, plus a bunch of elk, deer, and bison. This object was not any of those. The creature had weird colored eyes like deer. It was just watching and trying to hide, I think. The next day, my dad and we two boys went out and retraced the tracks. What a foot. On to the next one. In Macosta County in Michigan, at the home of Becky and Bob Kurtz in a wooded area near Barrington, two nights running on bare ground near the trash burner behind the house found 16 and a half by nine and a half inch footprints with five to six foot strides that were deep. Big and fierce dogs were terrified. The garbage was not disturbed, but spoiled peaches had disappeared. Bob cursed made two tracks. The tracks were seen by Jean Little, a wildlife photographer, and Gordon Charles, an outdoor editor. The deepest footprint was three and a half inches deep. The 178 pound man footprint was only 1.2 inches deep. On to the next one. I have lived in Michigan my whole life. I was living in Copper Harbor, just south of Copper Harbor proper when it happened. I had worked in lumber my whole life, even when I was a kid. So I spent most of my time around at the woods and mill plant. When we first moved up there, it was great, very peaceful, and we got a good piece of land, so we were happy. That summer, early June, our seven-year-old Tommy asked if he could have some leftovers for the dog. We did not have a dog, so I assumed it was just his imaginary playmate. But my wife, she was worried that maybe there was a wild animal. Our backyard was up against the woods, true enough, but it was fenced off, an all-weather stained fence buried about two feet down. I was not worried that any animal was going to get over or through it. I knew Tommy was just playing. I would keep an eye on him in the backyard when he would horse around, and the only time he would be even briefly out of view was when he weaved behind the large maple and clumps of sumac. As the summer wore on, Tommy would play in the backyard, you know, digging, throwing the ball with his friends and stuff that kids do. And in late June, he comes in and asks for food for the dog. I asked him about his dog. Can I meet your dog? I asked him. No, he does not like grown-ups. He will not come around if you are there, he told me. Okay, just make sure to keep him on that side of the fence, okay? I told him. Okay, he laughed and went back out. Then, I sneaked out and see Tommy throwing old hot dogs over the fence. I could hear nothing out there on the other side of the fence. I laughed and went back to sharpening my handsaw. Then, I swear, I heard snarling. I stopped the wheel and ran over. There was Tommy climbing down from the stepladder next to the fence. 
He had a smile on his face and nothing appeared to be wrong. Later, at dinner, Tommy asked if he could take the scraps out to his dog. His mother looked at me and winked because after I talked with her, she realized Tommy's dog was imaginary. Sure, his mother told him. Will that be enough? Yep, Tommy said. He pushed away from the table and ran outside, happy. It is good to see a happy seven-year-old. And if all it takes is an imaginary pet, then so be it. His mother and me sat there talking about his imaginary friend dog and were laughing. Then Tommy runs back in. Mom, can I have some more? He is really, really hungry today. His mother laughed and gave him a large soup bone and gristle from the stew she made. Tommy ran back outside. About a half hour later, Tommy comes back in and started watching TV. How's your dog friend? I asked him. Good. He was happy. He's full, I think. Tommy told me as he sat watching a cartoon video from earlier. It was that next day, Saturday, after dinner, that I went to put the lawnmower inside the shed. I saw the boy throwing pork chop bones over the fence. He stood there talking to his imaginary dog friend, then reached over the fence to pet him. Good boy. Just then, his mother came out and saw this. She laughed. Oh, he can pet his head just over the fence. That must be one big dog. We both smiled and laughed as Tommy climbed down the stepladder. Then I whispered to his mother, Yeah, keep him in the house for a few minutes, will ya? I need to go out there and clean that stuff up. He's been throwing food over the fence for the past three days. We're going to have raccoons moving in if I don't clean it up. Tommy, Tommy, come on. His mother called to him. Tommy ran excitedly to his mother. His mother told him, let's have some cake and watch Scooby-Doo. Tommy was happy for that and ran, jumping in the house with his mother holding his hand. Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo, Tommy began. This was immediately followed by his singing the Scooby-Doo theme song, scooby doo be doo where are you? Meanwhile, I opened the back gate and walked along the other side of it to the place where Tommy had been throwing the scraps for the past three days. When I got there, I was shocked and concerned because I saw nothing. There were no scraps, including the pork chop bones he just tossed over a few minutes before. I saw him throw them over the fence. Where'd they go? Then I heard something moving in the foliage about 20 yards away. I turned and it stopped. I did not know if it was a bear, a wolf, a dog, or whatever, but it was obviously something, something that was big enough to consume a pile of pork chop bones in an instant. I backed my way to the gate. I went inside and locked it. Then I could see the small trees on the other side of the fence sway as something brushed up against them. I ran over to Tommy's stepladder and peeked over the other side. I could not see anything, but I could tell the saplings in the distance away from the house were now swaying as something departed. I went into the house to talk to Tommy about his not-so-imaginary friend. I had so many questions. How big is the dog? I asked him. He's very big, Tommy answered. Is that why you can reach over the fence and pet him? I asked. Well, yeah, he's big, but I pet him because he is standing up, Tommy told me. What do you mean, he's standing up? I asked. He is standing up when he walks, Tommy told me. And after many more questions and frustrations, the best I could determine was this dog was walking around like a person, like a human. So after several restless nights, Tommy wanted to bring scraps to the dog again after dinner. His mother and I nervously agreed to it. Then I got the shotgun and sat on the porch behind him and waited. After a while, Tommy climbed down the stepladder and came back to the house. I guess he's not hungry tonight, Tommy told me. Then he got distracted with something and began running around the yard playing. I kept staring at the fence. Eventually, Tommy ran into the house to watch TV. I stayed on vigil outside, waiting, watching. Then, 
about 45 minutes after Tommy had gone into the house. I saw the bushes and trees moving on the other side of the fence. Closer, closer, closer. Then I heard scratching against the fence and saw two black hairy tufts of hair moving, bumping up just over the top of the fence. Then they disappeared. Then they popped up again. They were ears, pointed ears. I checked to make sure Tommy was in the house. He was glued to the television. I watched the ears bob up above the fence and then squeeze between the maple and the fence and then disappear. I jogged over to the stepladder just in time to see the shrubs in the distance shaking as something ran from the house. Whatever the dog was that my son was feeding, it had pointed ears. It had pointed ears. Bears don't have pointed ears, and wolves are not seven feet tall. The dog never came back after that, but Tommy drew many pictures of the dog. It was a giant, upright, walking dog. I used to quiz him, you know, try to trick him with pictures of bears, but he always came back to the same thing, the walking dog. Tommy said it was a dog. I know it was not a bear. The rest is anyone's guess. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!